I didn't exist until seven years after Super Mario 64's release, so I can't tell you from first-hand experience what an impact it truly had on video games as a whole. What I can say is that my mom has told me the story of the first time she played a Super Mario 64 demo in a Toys R Us. Being so confused and weirded out about the 3D aspects that were unfamiliar and how it felt in general. It made you feel lost, she said. It felt lost and lonely and almost like Mario was in a lost world. It felt mysterious. It was Mario, but it was weird. These are her exact quotes, by the way. Even though this is just one person's experience, it's safe to say that the general consensus is that Super Mario 64 has this very specific vibe to it. A vibe people either love and find alluring, or those who consider it a negative emotional aura. And then I realized, that's a lot like liminal spaces. Super Mario 64 is a liminal space. Its setting is this Dreamcore-esque world, or Peach's Castle, but there's so much more to it than just that. I remember being intrigued by Super Mario 64 when I played it as a young child, and the way the stages of the castle lobby looked stuck in my head for years, even though I'd only played it a couple of times as a kid, because I didn't really get into Mario 64 until I was 16. Which, if you do the math, was 23 years after its release. This game has never lost its hold on gaming culture. There is something genuinely special about it, and I wanted to get to the bottom of it. What is it about this game? It has to be more than simply the blocky 90s graphics, right? Okay, I have played through this game how you're supposed to, I went through a 16 star speedrunning phase and acquired such an impressive PB of 23 minutes, watched endless hours of streams and videos, but that wasn't enough. I hadn't tuned into a slippery nip stream in honestly a while, and I hadn't physically played it myself in longer. I needed a refreshing of all of the aspects of Super Mario 64. So I went through every detail in the entire game. The courses, the music, the lack of characters, every little thing, and jotted down what felt surreal, liminal, odd, or what I just enjoyed for some unexplainable reason. Here were my findings. If you don't know a whole lot about liminal spaces, I do have a video dedicated to them where I go over the history, the meaning behind them, and the ways they make us feel. Because I'm sure you've seen some of these pictures before, and they made you feel some type of way. And I bet Super Mario 64 does the exact same thing. Much like the way liminal space photos, for whatever reason, make people have similar reactions or feelings to them, during my research, I noticed how comments on a Mario 64 playthrough or the soundtrack were full of people putting my feelings about this game into words. Like, even if it was a half-formed thought of mine that didn't totally make sense, I'd read a comment and just understand what they meant, because I thought it too. It's almost like Luminal Spaces and Super Mario 64 had the same magic or charm to them. After going through every bit of the game, there were seven main so-called elements about Super Mario 64 that I thought properly represented why this game is the perfect depiction of liminality. Let's get into each one. The game begins outside of Peach's castle with nothing but Mario and a cameraman Lakitu. You are entirely alone in the game besides Lakitu lugging around this camera. No characters besides enemies and a few invisible toads stuffed into corners. The outside of the castle has this tranquil yet uncertain feeling to it. Like you're completely calm and undisturbed but you don't know what's lurking around the corner. It's like the liminal space photos that some people consider unsettling, where there's no one to be seen, so you'd expect it to be safe, but there's this underlying sense of danger. You make your way into the lobby, and all you can hear besides the echoey tune of inside the castle walls is Mario's footsteps. 
it's apparent that this is a game of solitude. The courtyard, which is the area where you're able to enter Big Boo's Haunt, might be my favorite part of the hub world. There's just something about it. It has this almost earthy ambience to it and feels like it was solely put here for Mario to explore. The game itself has an uncharted atmosphere and obviously this is the birth of Ella's Real 2401. After you beat Bowser in the Dark World, you unlock the key to the basement. I remember thinking during my first playthrough that the basement seemed so vast with a whole bunch of possibilities to explore. Even though there's only 15 main courses in Mario 64, the game really does feel like its own world. Like a lonely but vast world that has so many possibilities, but at the same time the isolation kind of makes it feel small. The loneliness is what I see being brought up most when people talk about Super Mario 64's weird vibe, and I understand, it's the very first feeling you get. And the first course you're able to play, unless you're LBLJing, is Bomb Bomb Battlefield. Now, the only notable weird features of Bomb Bomb Battlefield, in my opinion, are the falling bubbles that can kill you and the rolling iron balls. Something about them feels dreamlike, and they don't quite make sense. This introduces the second liminal element of the game. The dreamlike state that liminal space photos depict are the main reason they make me feel the way they do. And Mario 64 does the same. The name Hazy Maze Cave is extremely fitting. The entire game at a certain point starts to feel like a fever dream and has this foggy essence to it, like how it feels recalling a dream after you wake up. You're greeted with these unnerving gaps in the floor and these beady spiders called scuttlebugs. You're surrounded by signs that give you vague instructions and have to make your way through a room full of toxic gas. It's the kinds of nonsensical things you encounter in a dream. And in Hazy Maze Cave, you can unlock the metal cap. Now, there's not really a better way to phrase this, but some dreams just feel heavy or have distorted perception. And it seems like Mario 64 is full of that. Metal Mario feels heavy. In Tiny Huge Island, we're introduced to a recurring concept in Mario games. Introduced in World 4 of Super Mario 3, where enemies, blocks, all surroundings are large besides you. Mario games have always had these big levels, they're in the newer games as well. But something about it in Mario 64 feels more off. It feels like the weird wrong perspectives in dreams. In Snowman's Land, the tiny igloo is actually this massive room with ice walls and plays the Hazy Maze Cave music in the background only to make it feel more strange. TikTok Clock is some surreal chaotic shit. There are these dreams called geometric nightmares that can occur either while asleep or as a hypnagogic hallucination. I've experienced the hypnagogic side of it and to me it's eerily close to TikTok Clock. And Wet Dry World is what everyone talks about regarding the topic of Super Mario 64 being scary. I mean, there's already an entire video on it alone. It's full of rotating balls that will electrocute you, skeeters which are cuter scuttlebugs, purple bomb bomb looking creatures with antennas that throw you when you're trying to learn speedrunning tricks, the infamous town in the background, and the cage in the corner that leads you to a whole other part of the level. But the dream aspect isn't only unpleasant or bizarre. I think Rainbow Ride feels like a good dream. Even though there is still electrocuting balls with a sight of fire that'll burn you, I enjoy the upbeat energy, the bright blue cloudy sky in the background, and the fact you're just traveling up a rainbow. We got morphing triangles and a ship with wings, it's got a nice vibe. I especially like the building you go through towards the end, there's just something about it. I think it reminds me of a dream I had as a child. The actual courses aside, Super Mario 64 is filled to the brim with so many glitches that we're to this day finding more. It brings us back to the whole nonsensical aspect of dreams where you can punch a rabbit through a door, no clip into the back rooms, or swim through a wall.
It's probably mainly the music, which we'll touch on later, but Dire Dire Docks feels serene. I've never been a fan of water levels, I don't know who is, but watching Dire Dire Docks is mesmerizing. And even though I don't like water levels, I love Super Mario 64, which has a lot of water. Like, a sheer amount of water. I didn't realize until I went through the whole game before making this video. Like, there's water even when it doesn't make sense. This isn't only dreamlike, because I know I have the reoccurring freaky bathroom dream where everything is like overflowed with water and gross, but because, hear me out, I'm getting somewhere with this, Super Mario 64 is essentially the OG pool rooms. Level 37, commonly referred to as the pool rooms, is an expansive complex of interconnected rooms and corridors slightly submerged in undulating lukewarm water. Each area of the level varies greatly in size and structure, ranging from uniform pools and hallways to more open, abnormally shaped areas. The walls, ceilings, and floors of the level all appear to be constructed from the same white ceramic tile, with the only deviation from this color being the blue-green hue of the water. I love the pool rooms. I've had so many watery dreams in my day, and these are one of the coolest liminal spaces in my opinion. But let me give you a rundown of all of the water in Super Mario 64 that ultimately just feels unnatural. There's the first obvious water level being Jolly Roger Bay, but we're going to be discussing more on that later since it's a more simple, stereotypical water level. I will say the room with JRB's painting is a different story. While in-wall aquariums are a standard thing, them being made up of brick walls isn't. And how are these fish supposed to stay alive? Like, who is feeding them anymore? In this room, you discover the secret aquarium, a level where the player collects 8 red coins to obtain an extra star. And a little detail that's always been striking to me is how it has windows. And you can see it's in the middle of the sky for some reason. The other water level of the game, Dire Dire Docks, is only slightly less normal. The one part that has a weird pool room vibe is when you're above the water on the moving poles. Funnily enough, the two main water levels of Super Mario 64 have the least to do with this pool room's element. The moment I noticed this during my journey of meticulously going through the game was in the basement. I thought to myself, what's up with the slight flooding? It's throughout almost the entire basement, all the way up to Mario's stomach. So imagine chasing some glitchable bunny while being submerged in water. That's when I realized this strangely placed water is throughout the entire game. In Big Boo's Haunt, when you make your way to the merry-go-round, you're met with more flooding, making the whole area even more creepy. We've got more in Hazy Maze Cave with Dory and the Metal Cap section. Then obviously Wet Dry World as this level's gimmick is being able to control the level of the water with these multicolored diamond shapes that I learned are called Crystal Taps. I remember my first full playthrough of Mario 64 and feeling so on edge in Wet Dry World because if you don't get to a crystal tap in time or don't swim quickly enough to the caged town, you die. And if you're not fond of or skilled at water levels either, you'll learn somewhat early on that Mario realistically drowns. He doesn't fall off a platform and you get nothing but a game over screen. Mario dies in this game. There's 20 minute long videos showcasing all the ways you can die. And that brings us to the fourth element. Every time I see the horror of Super Mario 64 being mentioned, it does come off kind of creepypasta-ish to me, and I partly felt it was an exaggeration. But to be fair, there is a serious amount of freaky shit in this game. Jolly Roger Bay isn't only where the homicidal water is introduced, but you meet the terrifying eel. In order to get a star, you have to wait around him, hoping you don't either die first from drowning or that he doesn't kill you himself. And Bigaboo's Haunt is where the game is literally scary. 
You gotta shrink into the birdcage, and immediately you hear the menacing theme, see the gloomy background and scuttle bugs crawling around. For other enemies, we got books and chairs that fly around, and the piano. What was scarier, the piano or the eel? And the merry-go-round with the jarring, ear-piercing music, it's all around a horrifying course. Shifting Sandland has the quicksand that'll instantaneously kill you, murderous cubic enemies, more music that makes you feel hazy, and a blue chin pyramid. The inside of the pyramid is absolutely surreal. You have to fight these creepy hands with eyes called eye rocks. It's like some type of nightmare. All of it is reminiscent of the horror side of liminal spaces, or more so, the back rooms. Not to mention, the very first thing when you turn on the game is where you meet Mario the Stretchy Shapeshifter. You can contort his face in every way imaginable, and it's just so weird. It makes sense this game is surrounded by so many urban legends and creepypastas. It's the perfect candidate. Super Mario 64 definitely does have some legitimate horror aspects to it, and there's these realizations that happen throughout playing the game. Keep in mind, I watched Mario 64 speedrun streams almost daily for a year minimum, if not more. My nightly routine for a while there was turning on a 16 star stream and watching until I drifted off. But just like there's still being strat discoveries to this day, there were still things I hadn't really pieced together on why it had this mysterious feel, until now. And when I was revisiting Womp's Fortress, I realized, why does this game take place in the sky? It's something that is right in your face, considering the final level's name is Bowser in the Sky, but I don't think I ever stopped to think, like, why is it in the sky in the first place? I fell off countless times in Womp's Fortress when I played it for the first time, and sky levels in Mario have been around for decades, so it's not exactly the type of thing you really question or give much thought to. But the game takes place in the sky, and that's really weird. Remember when I mentioned the secret aquarium with the window showcasing the sky? or in Wet Dry World, where, based on the background, it takes place in the sky above an entire city. Cool Cool Mountain, Tall Tall Mountain, Rainbow Ride all have that same cloudy landscape and all you can repeatedly fall off of. And falling off of a course because you made just the slightest wrong move is the most irritating shit ever. Hell, even the cover art shows Mario in the sky with his wing cap on. Why is Super Mario 64 in the sky? I know I'm probably giving it too much thought and looking into it an insane amount, but it just adds to the peculiarity of the game. Like I said, the final course is Bowser in the sky. It's dark, somber, and instead of the bright blue clouds we're used to, there's the indistinct purple background that really gives it its specific feeling. Something about it doesn't feel as climactic as a final stage tends to be. It's more sad, or harrowing even. It almost reminds me of the way Castle Black feels, the last chapter of Super Paper Mario. But unlike Super Paper Mario that is extremely story-based and leads you up to the melancholy energy of the ending, Super Mario 64 lacks any story at all, really. This just proves how atmospheric the game truly is. One of the biggest reasons I think people still absolutely love Mario 64 to this day is it has an atmosphere of nostalgia, which is the sixth element. In my Liminal Space video, my findings on what makes Liminal Spaces so special to me pretty much boiled down to two things, the dreamy state of them and the nostalgia. Super Mario 64 hits both of these markers. When you first enter the castle, the lobby has a checkered floor, with its walls being covered in clowns and hills, giving it a childhood reminiscent feeling. These checkered floors and childlike rooms are all throughout the game. 
For some reason, Cool Cool Mountain is what I remembered the most from my brief playing when I was a kid. And I couldn't even tell you what it is that stuck out in my child brain, but something did. Maybe I thought the cottage was cute or the baby penguin. But this course is what I always remembered. Tall Tall Mountain is another with a very childlike feel to it. Mushrooms are prevalent in the nostalgia-based liminal space photos, and this level is full of them. The slide is also adorable. Maybe some of you think it's nothing more than it being made in 1996, or that we all played it as children, so we automatically get that sense of nostalgia in childhood. But I think there's at least a little more to it. Super Mario 64 holds something special. But the most notable element that invokes the nostalgia of Super Mario 64, for me, is without a doubt the soundtrack. I could hear the file select theme on loop for so long. It's the second song you hear right after Shapeshifter Mario, and I think it perfectly captures the journey you're about to embark on. And when you listen to it after a playthrough, you're flooded with memories of the first time you discovered the magic of Super Mario 64. Every time I hear this, I can't help but cry. It just reminds me of simpler times and happier days where everything wasn't so complicated what childhood sounds like. When I listen to this, I feel like I'm home. This music makes me think that everything isn't that bad as I think it is. Piranha Plant's Lullaby sounds like babyhood. It's really soothing to me and is another nostalgic theme. Powerful Mario that plays whenever Mario puts on his wing cap is another track filled with feelings. I imagine this is what it was like to be high on cocaine in the 80s. About sums it up. The theme in Big Boo's Haunt feels like some freaky back room and is so fitting for the course. I can't imagine more suitable music. Cave Dungeon, which plays in both Hazy Maze Cave and Wet Dry World, is an unsettling take on the original underground theme. It also plays in the Blue Chin Pyramid of Shifting Sandland and the Igloo in Snowman's Land, all encapsulating the strangeness of each. This is Dire Dire Dox's moment. I read this comment how it's odd the song is titled Dire Dire Dox when it first plays in Jolly Roger Bay, but I don't find it odd. I associate it with Dire Dire Dox. It fits it better. JRB has the eel. Dire Dire Dox is completely blissful. I play this whenever I feel like I need to rediscover myself. It really does wonders. Never forget who you are, you guys. It's the key to helping you out on your future. I think they got a point because this actually makes sense to me. There is a video on YouTube titled Dire Dire Dox, but you're listening to it underwater, which is a slightly edited version that sounds more muffled. This is when it becomes evident my liminal space theory holds up. People said it felt like the obscure side of the mall, cold side of a pillow, and this song always gave me the vibes of interior hotel pools without windows. This is the type of song that would be playing in the background of a video titled Only Familiar Places That You've Never Been To. I don't know why, but the paintings bring me that exact feeling. A liminal space in audio form. There's mentions of childhood memories or how it feels like the past slipping away, but remembering it in contentment. Probably years ago at this point, I read a comment that I unfortunately couldn't find anymore. It essentially said they imagined that this song is what dying would feel like if death wasn't that bad after all. I wish I could find the comment. I understood what they meant. I honestly felt the same. I could keep going on and make an entire video on the Dire Dire Dox theme. I'm sure anyone is irritated by the looping stair song right as you're about to enter Bowser in the Sky, but dude, hearing this non-stop until you successfully learn how to BLJ, nah. The composers know how to make you feel joyous and also know how to annoy the shit out of you. But not only does Bowser in the Sky give that castle black feeling, but Bowser's Road almost reminds me of the Castle Black theme. 
the right balance of optimism met with the reality of death and despair. Last, but certainly not least, is the staff credits. The ending song of Super Mario 64. Hearing this at the end of a successful speedrun is beautiful. Hearing it at all is, really. This must be life's end credits theme. It's so nostalgic and happy, yet you can feel the heavy grief of something finally concluding. But what gives that what we were striving for when we began, and what we got when we finished? It was worth it. 0% Mario crying hyper-realist blood in a personalized copy of Mario 64, 100% nostalgia. I know being an adult is scary, it sucks to grow up, but don't worry, you'll always have this Mario soundtrack to remember the happy kid and childhood you have many years ago. It's such a bittersweet song, and it seriously does feel like growing up, looking back on being a kid, missing it, but knowing you gotta keep going on in life, and that you still have a journey ahead of you. This soundtrack holds so much emotion. Super Mario 64 was the original Dreamcore aesthetic. It hits every qualification for a liminal space in my eyes, and this game seriously is magical. It's still so relevant to this day, has an atmosphere unlike any other, and is insanely captivating to play or simply watch. This game means a lot to me, as it does to others. If I ever want to jump into a happy place, I can turn on Super Mario 64 and I'm brought there. I'm sure others feel the same way, even taking the eel and piano into account. It feels like an altered state of reality that brings back memories, both of the game itself and of life in general. I hope you enjoyed this video, it was honestly a blast to go through everything about the game and try to get to the bottom of what makes Super Mario 64 the way it is. I'd consider it one of the most memorable and special games of all time. There's gotta be a reason why it stayed entirely relevant for 26 years now, and I think the popularity of Liminal Spaces thankfully caused a resurgence of it outside of just the speedrunning community. I'm satisfied to have created somewhat of an answer to Super Mario 64's peculiar existence, and unraveling its so-called seven elements of liminality. Thank you.